B2B is business to business, and it's all about organizations, businesses that are selling products, services, and solutions to other businesses. So anytime you're providing products, services, and or solutions to other businesses, we call that business to business or B2B for short. Welcome to the My Future Business Show, where we get you in front of your best audience and keep you there. Not only are we interviewing the biggest names in business to help you become even more successful, we're inviting you to book your spot on the show to help you grow your business. So at the end of the call, make sure you fill in the interview application form at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. Hello there and welcome back to the show. My name's Rick Nusky. I hope you're excited as I am because today I'm on the line with the wonderful Michael Haynes. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you for having me, Rick. Absolutely a pleasure. Now, you and I were just, uh, you know, spinning the wheels about the weather, but uh, the core of today's call, Michael, you and I are going to be talking about the new B2B buyer, three critical things that must happen to drive B2B growth, and the reasons behind why some current marketing sales tactics may be undermining your B2B company. Now, there's a lot to unpack there, Michael, but before we do any of that, it's, it's a little bit customary for us to learn um, some more about you. So where are you located? Where are you calling in from today? Uh, great. Uh, so, Rick, my name is Michael Haynes, dialing in from Sydney, Australia, uh, and I am an SME business growth specialist. So my focus and passion, Rick, is working with business owners, CEOs of your service-based small, medium-sized businesses and helping them to how they can acquire and retain those business clients to attain the growth and impact that they seek. So I'm very much your SME B2B specialist. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you very much for, for sharing that. Now, I'd love to learn a little bit about you prior to going into the core of what that means to those who work with you. You said you're calling in from Sydney. Um, is that where you live? Is that your home location? So, yeah, so great question, Rick. So Sydney is my home uh, base. I've been here for 22 years, but you can tell from my accent, or maybe I should say lack thereof, I'm not a <laughs> born and bred Australian. Um, I am from uh, from Canada, from Toronto originally. Oh, beautiful. And so I am based here in Australia. I consider myself fortunate to have two homes. Australia and Canada are two of my core markets. Yep. Uh, I would say Australia, Canada, and US are my three primary markets. Mm -hmm. uh, but do work with clients globally. But Sydney is my uh, home base. It's headquarters for the business Listen, Innovate, Grow. Now, tell me something about uh, the differences or similarities, as it may be, between Australia and Canada. I know there are lots. Um, similarities, I think we have a very uh, good disposition. We're very friendly. We're very outgoing, somewhat adventurous. Um, I think we like have a lot of similar interests around sports and being physically active and doing things around food, culture, all those kinds of things. Where mm -hmm. the difference, I think, come is really from a from a geographic, from a weather perspective. Uh, yes. um, what you folks call here in Australia cold, uh, me being Canadian from Toronto, <laughs> I have a different definition. Um, winter days here in Canada, here in Australia, are pretty much to me like just nice fall days because I can put on leather jacket turtleneck jeans and you know head out with friends or doing what i have to do yep. whereas in canada when i was in toronto you know cold days often met you know putting on the parkas you know the gloves yes, scarves, sir. Uh, the, 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 the glove warmers and getting out and shoveling snow and dealing with uh frostbite and all those kinds of things so <laughs> that's where there's a divergence absolutely people say cold um uh, I often have to say, okay, we're talking about really. cold or real cold. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. I, uh, I, uh, I, t I, I noticed that you talked about going out with friends. Do you like socializing? And if you do, and when you do, what do you like to do? So in terms of, yeah, so on the weekends, you know, I love to go out. I will catch up with friends. And, you know, when they go to lunch, um, I do like to cook. So having friends oh. over, entertaining, doing that as well uh, are some hey. of the things I enjoy doing. So, yeah, I, I'm a fairly social person. Uh, I've been known to be the one to organize the birthday events. <laughs> um, think, plan, and execute is very much my motto. So I do that in business and I do that in personal, on my personal life as well about making things happen. Well, this is very interesting that you say that because you seem very process oriented and you seem to have a, a good control over what you want in, in your life, which I think is very important for somebody in your position. Now, tell me a little bit, when you were growing up, did you have any mentors around you? Because I remember when I was younger, I had somebody I always looked to for advice and guidance. Do you have anybody like that in your life that you can recall? Um, in my early days, 
Um, well, I think my mother was always a mentor. Um, mm -hmm. She was always one to instill the value of hard work and education. Yep. So my mother and my grandmother, are, I, I would be, I guess, my early mentors. Then uh, during my days in high school, uh, I competed a lot in athletics. So I think that's part of where I developed my strong work ethic about uh, and discipline and being resilient because our coach was very much about that. You know, we've got to work through the good times and the bad things aren't always going to go to plan. So mm -hmm. that's been another mentor. And then in my career, uh, early in my career, worked in financial services. Yep. One of the, my uh, branch managers, uh, when I was working at a branch in Ottawa while in university, Sarah Chamberlain served as quite a big mentor as well in terms of just navigating the politics, knowing what you need to do, keeping your nose clean, she used to say, <laughs> has been a big, uh, has been a big mentor. And then I also had another one later in my career, once I got into strategy and business, um, a lady by the name of Dr. Sandra Burke, who is quite yep. a guru in strategy and marketing, who's really helped me from, I guess, from a technical functional perspective around being customer centric, buyer centric mm -hmm. and, and developing actionable strategies. So I've had a number of people along the way that have advised me, guided me. And now I do have a, a, a group of mentors that I work with as part of working on the business, part of working on my growth mindset as well. Thank you very much, Michael. Now, part of all this uh, would obviously dovetail into um, discipline. Uh, we have a lot of startups on the show, uh, as well as existing small to medium sized business owners who'd be listening in this, into this call intently. Now, part of that for the startups, especially who don't really know how important it is to take a break and have uh, routines. Could you share a little bit about what your day looks like for a start? Are you an early riser? Yeah, so I'm an early riser. I often, uh, particularly at the end of the week, I will get up extra early, uh, 4 to 6 a.m. That's because I do have calls with Canada and the U.S. So I try mm -hmm. to do a lot of those overseas calls toward the end of the week. But I'm very much a morning person. Mm -hmm. So I will get up in the mornings. Um, you know, I will check emails and then I will... Um, kind of just do a bit of a review of what I'm going to be doing for my day and what are the three key things that I must achieve by the end of the day. Yep. Uh, I tend to go to gym four to five times a week, uh, generally Monday to Thursday and doing weights and cardio. So I factor in that time between five and 6.30 mm -hmm. uh, and, and make sure I factor that in. Um, I'm fairly disciplined with the respect that I've decided that, you know, I try to do most of my work Monday to Friday. Saturdays are kept completely free. Yes. There'll be no work done whatsoever. Right. Uh, and then Sundays, I may do a little bit of work, but I try to keep that fairly um, just to mm -hmm. a couple of hours because I do feel it's important that you have time to switch off, reset, have some fun and just get your mind and your body right to be able to tackle all the challenges of working in the business and working on the business. You know, you've talked about hitting three targets every day or goals or achievements every day. And I, I wonder how that affects mindset when people don't actually hit those targets each day. Is it, is it okay to, you know, say, hey, look, that's all right, and just get back on the bike? How do you deal with it when you don't meet your, meet your goals? Okay, so Rick, I pick only three, I pick three because it's very easy if you have a massive to-do list like I used to make and you'd have all of these things, <laughs> 10, 12 things you need to be doing, but then, but things happen, you know, um, meetings pop up in your diary, clients have urgent, you know, urgent issues, life happens, yes. and then you end up out of those 10, 12 things, you might get, you know, just one or two things done. So I limit it to three because I think three is, um, generally realistic and what are the three most important things I need to get done yeah uh, there may be other things on the list but I, but I just focus yep. on three uh, and generally it tends to work if I if it doesn't um, happen I at the end of each day will evaluate okay how did the day go what do I need to be doing for the next day yep. uh, so that's that's pretty you much can roll how it over I, yeah, yeah thank, now, thank you again for the feedback now I, I, I sit here and I think to myself well um, I wonder always wonder about this question when did you recognize that you had an entrepreneurial uh, streak in you was it something that you were born with do you rem do you remember you know in your early days as a child maybe washing cars and things like that do you have do you have a memory of your first entrepreneurial thing you've ever done um yes rick but i think my entrepreneurial um the spark started to ignite probably much later mm -hmm. after i finished my mba going into my first um, going into probably my second corporate role post MBA when I was working at Kraft Foods right. as a marketing information manager. There were two independent consultants that I was working with quite closely and they were working, they only worked nine months of the year and they worked hard for nine months of the year. They took three months off, 
both were avid travel fans such as myself and it was through working and talking with those ladies that it sparked that i said you know somewhere down the line i'd like to be able to have that flexibility that control work hard play even harder travel and so it started later in my career yeah what from post mba from that from that role at craft and working with ben Betty and Evie, that's when the, the, the light was kind of sparked. And then I yeah. come from a family of entrepreneurs. Uh, my sister has her own law practice. Uh, my cousin, uh, she has her own business doing uh, uh, renovations. Her husband has his own construction business. So I, I'm it's surrounded there. by a lot of entrepreneurs in the family. So that yeah. added um, fuel to the spark um, that was ignited um, early in my post MBA career. And I can tell you a very high energy, and I think that's very important that a lot of people don't recognize how important it is to find that balance that you've already talked about, you know, having a day off at least one day of a week and just allowing yourself to be human again, I guess you'd almost say. But um, with all that being said, I think about people all the time and how we can be helpful because um, that's what business is, is people um, transforming an input to an output and getting a result, no matter what that, that be across any industry sector, I find that to be a common thing. Now, when I think about that, I, I look at your previous role as a customer research and strategy manager, and I wonder, what have you learned about customers? Uh, what have I learned about customers? Uh, I've learned, a, oh, gosh, where do I begin with? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I've learned a number of things. Um, customers all have needs, expectations, and behaviors that are continually changing. Mm -hmm. So one thing I've learned, it is important to stay on the pulse and to be listening to your customers. Um, yep. Very important. Uh, you need to be listening to them. And it doesn't have to be Rick doing massive, uh, you know, surveys and using segmentation. A lot of the big corporate uh, pro approaches used by big corporates, having conversations and listening appropriately, asking good questions, recording those those responses, and then sharing them is so so important. So that listening to your customers and mm -hmm. listening regularly is critical. See, that's the thing, isn't it? We've over complexed our existence with the, with the advent of technology. I think technology most certainly has a place, but there's a time and a place for simplicity, isn't there? Absolutely. There is very much a time and place for simplicity. And uh, for us as being small, medium business owners, we have to remember that and not get caught up in all of the new shiny wheels, uh, new shiny objects that are, keep coming out. And, but that having that listening, listening to your customers and listening to your industry and markets is foundational and critical. And you must do it regularly and continually and feed that information back into the business. I cannot stress that enough. So let's shift gears a little bit. I'd love to learn a little bit about Listen, Innov uh, uh, Listen, Innovate and Grow as a business idea. Where was the genesis for this? I know that you touched on uh, there was a moment in time whilst you were working for a corporation that you said, look, one day I want to, you know, basically fly alone. Yep. But where did you come up with the core idea for your business? So the core I did for my business, Rick, stemmed from my last corporate role when I was working at Telstra Wholesale, heading up a uh, manager of customer research and analysis in their wholesale business, their B2B business. Right. It was um, coming up to the end of that career where I was given the, it was coming to that crossroads. I was reaching the big 4.0 coming up yeah. <laughs> uh, back then. And uh, it was kind of, I, I offered the opportunity to go into their top talent program. And I thought, no, uh, first I want to travel and go to South America and volunteer and give back and, mm -hmm. and uh, do some of those great life things. And then when I came back, I uh, set up my initial business, which was initially called 2XL and focusing on working with um, small, medium businesses, operating in that whole business to business context. Now, what is it that, uh, you know, do you have a primary set of um, customers uh, where, I guess, where is the majority of your customer base right now? I know that you operate in Australia, Canada and the US, but uh, if you were to say, where is the largest portion of that? Would it be in the States? Uh, a large, large portion, I would say it's between Australia and Canada. Oh, wow. Yeah, and yeah. I would say, yeah, Australia and Canada, sorry, sorry, Australia and the US, sorry, in that order. Yeah, yeah, Australia. fantastic. Thank yeah. you very much for opening up and sharing. I know that the audience is going to get a lot of value out of this. Now, I'd love to explore a little bit more about the Listen, Innovate and Grow title. Is that yeah. something that just came to you overnight? So Listen, Innovate, Grow um, is, is the name of my consultant from the name of my business, because I want you to have a name that is really reflective of I guess my core beliefs of what is necessary for small, medium businesses to succeed in B2B and listen, innovate, grow are the three key activities 
all businesses have to do, but I focus on working with my people of, you know, SMEs operating B2B. There are, those are the three activities you must do on an ongoing basis in a very specific buyer driven manner in order to acquire, retain and grow customers. So I wanted the name to really uh, encapsulate the essence of what is needed to thrive and succeed in the world of B2B. See, it's, and it's not a confusing title. So many people try to over complex their, their titles and they get lost in the, the fancy word that they've just made up. And clearly, listen, Innovate Grow is not going to do that to anybody. Now, I, I'd love to go back to that moment in time, Michael, if you could, that you acquired your first client or customer, whatever you like yes. to refer them as, and then you realized that you were onto something that could help businesses. How did that feel? And can you remember that moment? Oh, yeah, I can remember that. So that's really going back to 2011. I just came back from South America. I'd already decided that I wanted to go solo and set up my own shingle, as they say. Uh, yes. Um, and so I, you know, started, you know, um, writing my business plan and what I was looking to do. Um, and as a first uh, port of call in terms of client acquisition, tapping into your network is the first thing that I did. A uh, former colleague from Telstra said, oh, I have someone who I think could uh, use uh, some of your services. And so my first client was working for the global marketing director of an HR talent acquisition consulting firm. Uh, so that was my first project. Um, it was a nice chunk of work, six week project, uh, identifying growth opportunities for the business. And so that was the first client that I worked for. Um, and yeah, the project went really well. And so that was kind of validation that I, uh, have what it takes to be able yep, to deliver. Yep. Um, and cause this is a person that I was referred to, but didn't have any prior uh, working relationship. Uh -huh. And, and Rick, this global marketing director was pretty demanding. You know, she had <laughs> high standards, uh, yep. in terms of, you know, output deliverables and to be able to deliver, um, was quite, what was great. Um, uh, she, in an full transparency. She was hoping to give me, uh, put me on for further work, but then the company got restructured and uh -huh. management and then she ended yeah. up moving overseas. So that, um, future opportunity didn't Changed. materialize, but, um, it was a great first project, um, well-received and I still keep in touch with her. Now she's doing something completely different, but that mm -hmm. was kind of the validation to say, I can do this. I can get remunerated for it. Um, I can deliver what the market needs. What and it wants, so yep. Let's let's go forth and um, go and forth conquer. and conquer. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Now I know, as human beings, some of us, not all of us, um, um, can be exposed to this this idea of fear. Was there ever any fear early on that this might not work? And how did you manage that psychologically? Did where was your mindset at? Did you ever have those moments? Um, Rick, I'll be honest with you. I think we always have those moments as being entrepreneurs. We always, you know, we go through the cycles where, you know, it can be a bit volatile up and down yes. as an independent consultant. Mm -hmm. And so the days when you're really busy and, you know, my calendar is full and I'm working on projects, I'm working in the business, on the business, the energy is, is 20 out of 10. You're feeling really good and really positive, but you also have those, those, those valleys where things slow down. It's harder to, you know, the, the projects, the, the, the prospects aren't converting, uh, and, and it's in those times when things are going slow and, and, and sales cycles are being drawn out where you can start to question and doubt. Hence why I'm a big believer on working on your mindset. So I okay. do a lot of reading of books. I listen to a lot of podcasts mm -hmm. regularly to keep me in the zone, to keep my body, to keep my mind sharp um, and Excellent. keep it in that, in that frame. So I'm constantly doing it because it, it, it's, it's an up and down um, yeah, it, 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 yeah. It's, it's, it, it's up and down. Even when you're doing all the right things, um, things can take uh, longer. Things don't uh, go as planned. Things change out of left field. You can deliver great to a client, Rick, but there have been times when there's been a change internally because they've run out of financing or a new CEOs come in and have done a complete changeover. Changeover, and so now your services are no longer required because, well, your immediate client has <laughs> on the door. Um, yeah. it happened to me 16 months ago where things were going well, but then company was there was a bit of an internal coup with one of my clients, and yep, yep, there it changed. goes. So, yep, yeah, so you have to. So, working on mindset continually is very, very important to keep you in the zone, um, so that you can, um, 
overcome those those, those moments of fear a thrive and strive forward i love this call it's such a wonderful insight into the way you think and the way that you operate your business which we're going to be looking at in a moment now just for context you've already touched on some of the names but you've worked with some pretty significant brands out there you've mentioned craft um who else have you worked with the likes of <laughs> sorry Thank you, Rick. I've worked with, uh, in terms of the big corporates, I've done work with uh, Kraft. Uh, I've done work with uh, Commonwealth Bank. I was at Accenture as a strategy consultant. So I've worked with the likes of uh, Volkswagen. Um, Microsoft. I've done, uh, Microsoft. I've done a little bit of work with Air Canada, Canadian Airlines way back earlier in my career, um, yeah, uh, just after my MBA. Mm -hmm. um, I, wow, some big yeah, names I've worked, worked with a raft of companies. I've worked with the Australian Trade and Investment Commission mm -hmm. uh, as their uh, go-to-market uh, partner for their international startups and scale-ups. So those are some of the bigger brands um, in, uh, in terms of the bigger end of town of some that I've worked with. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Now let's shift gears completely and go into some foundational things that some people may not understand. Now I know you and I understand uh, the reference to B2B, but what does that actually mean? Great uh, uh, question, Rick. So B2B is business to business, and it's all about uh, organizations, businesses that are selling products, services, and solutions to other businesses. So for example, myself being a business consultant, providing services around business growth, customer strategy to other businesses, that's business to business. If you're a caterer and you're providing catering services to companies for their uh, conferences, luncheons, and workshops, that's a business to business uh, B2B relationship because you're one business selling your services, catering services to other businesses. Uh, yes. A graphic designer who's providing graphic design services to marketing agencies, to IT companies, to law firms, that's B2B. A law firm providing legal services to other uh, companies uh, and or government, that's business to business. So uh, anytime yes. you're providing products, services, and or solutions to other businesses, we call that business to business or B2B for short. Thank you for, for sharing. Now, now that we have that uh, done and dusted, tell me a little bit about um, some of the common problems that you see when you're working with new clients. Are there common problems? Yes, there are some common problems, Rick. Uh, in terms of, in business to business, one of the key things you have to recognize is that there will be multiple decision makers involved in the decision making. Even if you are selling SME to SME, uh, so if you're, um, uh, as an example myself, as a consulting firm selling my services into another business, there will be multiple decision makers. Yeah. And you need to be making sure the core premise uh, of my business and the core premise to succeed in business to business is that you must be buyer driven. By that, Rick, I mean you must focus on those who make the decisions to buy, those that make the decision and those that have input and in influencing the decision. That is where you often need, to, that's where you need to be focusing yep. a lot of your efforts around your marketing and sales activities. Quite often what I see with many businesses, both large corporate, but more importantly, for our people of small, medium businesses, we have mm -hmm. not identified who are the true decision makers. So we don't know who the decision makers are. And often either they haven't identified them at all, um, or they, they are misguiding their efforts, focusing on the users of their services as opposed to uh. those who make the decision. And that distinction, Rick, becomes particularly important when you're going into larger organizations. Because, yeah. for example, a um, an IT example, for example, you may be providing uh, cybersecurity project management services to various companies such as banks and insurance companies, for example, you're providing those services. You will have those that are going to be involved intimately and in using your project management, your cybersecurity services. Uh, but however, those that make the decision could be a completely different set of three, four or five people who might sit at mid and senior levels. Very important you know who those people are, what are their priorities and how they make buying decisions. Uh, so, so it's very important that you identify who are your decision makers, mm -hmm. what are their priorities and yep. how they buy. And what I mean by how they buy, Rick, is what are the different activities they undertake as part of their decision-making process. So are they searching online? Are they talking to people? Are they attending certain events? Are they reading certain white papers and articles? Are there certain industry experts, industry groups that they will refer to for advice, uh -huh. insights, information? Very important, Rick, that we identify 
again, who those people are, what are their priorities, and those various activities. And there will be multiple activities that they undertake. We need to understand what those are because that defines what your marketing, sales, business development activities need to be. Uh, this goes back to the title that we touched on earlier, how some of the strategies we might use might not be serving us that well. Now, I'd like to know, we've touched on when we talked about customers earlier, Michael, uh, the importance of listening, but now let's shift gears and look at uh, and break down what innovation means to you. Great question. So innovation, innovation, Rick, I'm talking about business innovation. And by business innovation, I'm talking about uh, new introductions and or improvements uh, into your business, which can occur across one of five areas. It could be around your products. So making mm -hmm. product enhancements, uh, modifications, introducing new product lines. It could be services. So that could be around introducing new services, enhancing your services. It could be process innovation. So looking around, uh, introducing, changing, or improving the processes used within your organization. Organizational innovation. So that's looking at things like uh, undertaking outsourcing, non-core activities, joint ventures, partnerships. Um, organizational innovation is one of the innovations I believe every small and medium business should be looking to undertake because partnering, collaborating uh, you know, with other suppliers, potentially your customers as well, is a great way to drive growth within your business. Uh, yep. And finally, uh, marketing innovation. And so marketing innovation, it's about introducing, uh, making changes, introducing kinds of uh, marketing strategies, B2B specific marketing strategies that they should be considering, such as uh, advocacy programs, leveraging micro influencers, uh, account-based strategy initiatives. So business innovation is around making new introductions or changes that might be major ones they could be minor ones but it's identifying where are those opportunities to make those changes or improvements across one or more of those five categories that i've spoken about we live in uh, tumultuous times i would suggest at the moment there's a lot going on around the world so how does a business who is looking to grow um, navigate through these times in moments of contraction market contraction and uh, you know how do they use innovation in this regard Great question, Rick. So the first thing they need to be doing is they need to be listening. Because yeah. by listening, you're going to gain that understanding of where you need to be focusing. And you need to be listening first on three levels. One, you need to be listening to you. And when I call listening to you, I'm talking about listening to you as the business owner, as well as understanding your business. So what are, you know, what, where's the vision? Where do you want to take your business? Understanding what are the strengths core competencies of your business. So where is the business having success in terms of kinds of customers, the kinds of products and services, um, you know, the different industries and markets that they're, they're operating in? Do you want to have an understanding of where you're winning? Where do you have your strengths? And then listening to your customers. So what are the needs, expectations, you know, what are the requirements of what your current customers uh, have that you're currently uh, serving? Um, as well as some of those prospective clients. So having an understanding of those uh, requirements, uh, customer needs, what, what they're gonna be needing, where their priorities are. So doing that listening and having a clear sense of what you're good at combined mm -hmm. with what's going on in the industries and markets that you're currently operating and maybe potentially seeking to operate and as well as understanding your client customer needs and priorities, that will give you clarity as to, okay, where you need to be focusing on what industries, what markets, what, what kinds of customers you should be focusing on. And based on the needs, priorities, and requirements, that will then give you an understanding of what are, of those five different levers, what are some of the things that you need to be doing? Do you need to be coming up with some new, better offerings and solutions? Or mm. do you need to be enhancing some of your service levels? Do you need to be changing some of your marketing activities to uh, better align with uh, the requirements of the, those clients and customers that you're serving? Um, are there opportunities for you to collaborate uh, with other uh, small businesses, other service providers to tap in to some of the clients and customers you seek? So it's really from that listening, that understanding, in yep. terms of your business, the industry and market that you're serving and seek to serve, as well as understanding your customers and the buyers, the those uh. decision makers, having that understanding will give you that clarity of focus. And then innovation is the levers we use in terms of how we're going to meet those industry market customer buyer needs. 
I wonder, how do you meet a new client where they are in their business? What is the process that you have to go through as an organization to, you know, uh, align with them so you know what to recommend? It's a bit of discovery, fact finding. I, I like mm -hmm. to always do a bit of an audit and assessment to understand where they're at yep. in terms of how the business is performing. What are the objectives? What are their strengths? Uh, what do they know ar around the industry's markets that they're uh, currently serving, seeking to serve? What do they know around the clients uh, that they're currently serving, looking to serve? Uh, and what do they know about those decision makers and buyers within those organizations? So that uh, doing an in-depth audit and assessment, yep. Yep. Um, which is kind of in line with the listening, that is my first uh, starting point. Got it. Yep. And from there, I will identify what's the roadmap, what are some of the gaps and what's the path, the action plan we need to take to move Got it. forward. Yeah, love it. Now, you are very high energy. There must have been a point in time where you said, I have to put this into a book or how did it come about? Did somebody else say, Hey, you need to write a book? So how that came about, that came about in two, around 2015. I'd always had a thought around writing a book um, mm -hmm. that could be really serving the needs of small and medium businesses in B2B because there was not a lot out there for our people. A lot yep. of the books around B2B are very much written towards big corporate. So they talk about customer insight and using, you know, things like market segmentation and customer value analysis <laughs> uh, yeah. um, approaches, which is Deep all well stuff. and good, but that's not, that's not going to be relevant for any small or medium business until if or when they become a mid-market, much yep. larger organization. Um, yep. So I wanted to write a book that still was very uh, market-driven, very strategic, very practical and actionable. And so it was identifying that gap in the market, as well as the fact that I was reading an article as part of my daily regular reading. Uh, a New York Times columnist, James Altshower, was talking about what are the 10 things you need to do in order to kind of take your business to the next level if you want to take your business brand to the next level. Number four, write a book. Uh, number five, <laughs> see number four. So it was a combination of seeing that article combined to where I was at. I said, I think it's time do it. to uh, write a book because it can serve a number of purposes, both building my own brand, but also supporting and helping the market that I seek to serve, which is small and medium businesses. So how did you find the journey uh, to becoming an author? Was it uh, was it difficult or did you enjoy the whole process? I very much enjoyed the whole process, Rick. Um, I was kind of learning and leading and doing at the same time. So, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, learning about the whole writing process and what was required, what is needed to publish and market a book. So I was learning all of that, planning it out at the same time, uh, writing the book and working with my co-author, uh, Gareth Chandler, who was absolutely fantastic to work with in that whole process. How long did it take from start to finish? From start to finish, from our very first workshop session that we had uh, in his uh, home office in Melbourne to when we finished, about 16 months. Yeah, that's it doesn't take long, although it does seem to take a while. Now, do you do you prefer to pick up the pen or did you were, were you on a keyboard doing this as you were? Um, I like to do the first very rough draft in pen, sorry, in, yep. on, on the computer, but then yep. I like to do my edits. I like to get, I'm old school, get the pen out, print off the, the chapter and Love go it. through and I yep. need to do my edits manually. Um, that's how I edit and then I can just, you know, key them back in. So, um, yeah, so it was, and it yep. took a while to, to get used <laughs> to, because I'm old school, very much like to write, but I found out yep. to yep. put that first draft out there very clunky on on the keyboard and then print off and then do my revisions um, manually. I have a, a very special spot on the show for authors uh, alongside with business owners. Now, I, I always ask this question. How did you know when it was finished? Uh, how did I know when it's finished? Well, we had a, a fairly detailed outline. So once we address all the chapters and all the content and we both uh, exchange our respective chapters and we reviewed each other's, once we did that, uh, in-depth review, then we were like, okay, let's leave it alone. It. And now let's give it yep. to a consultant to do the structural edits. So yeah, fantastic. Um, yeah. So that's how we, we kind of um, came to that process. And then she drove a lot of the further revisions uh, and requirements to get it to uh, publishing quality. Tell me, Michael, is there another book in the winds? Uh, I've been getting asked that a few times, <laughs> perhaps later 2023, um, Gareth and I might look to start a second book. Um, right. Great. 
uh, so yeah, there, there could be a second one in 2023, 2024. Excellent. Thank you. This is a wonderful call. Having so much fun on this. Now, we're already at the pointy end of the call, and I'd love to talk about your website, Listen, Innovate and Grow. Tell us what people are going to find on that website. Uh, yeah. So on listeninnovategrow.com, all one word, that's the repository. Mm -hmm. That's SME B2B Central. So you'll find various articles written on all kinds of topics pertaining to B2B marketing, strategy, innovation, um, there are podcast interviews, uh, published articles. Uh, you'll also find out about some of my um, services and programs, yes. uh, such as I'm going to be launching shortly an online SME B2B community legacy will be launched shortly, as well as some of my other services being the workshop planning, the Empower Mastermind group as well. So it's a repository for all insights, articles, tools, and templates as well around uh B2B marketing, sales, strategy, innovation, and planning, uh, along with an outline of, of services and upcoming events, uh, such as live streams that I'm going to be doing with guest speakers on various topics uh, pertaining to business growth and being an SME in the world of B2B. Thank you again, Michael. Now, if you're on this call today and you're looking to make a start in this space, make sure you visit listeninnovategrow.com. I'll be making sure that the links back to Michael and all of his wonderful work are on that uh, page below the post. You'll see the link as well as uh, links back to Amazon where you can buy this book and there are other places you can buy. You can certainly start at uh, listeninnovategrow.com. Uh, have a look around at the menu. Make sure you uh, touch base with Michael. He doesn't buy it too hard. <laughs> and with all that being said, Michael, what a wonderful Cool. Thank you very much for joining me on the show today. Thank you so much, Rick. It was a great conversation. Thanks for joining us today. If you enjoyed the call, then make sure to subscribe, leave a comment, share us with your friends, and book your spot on the show at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. And if you're looking for solutions that will help grow your business, then visit myfuturebusiness.com forward slash shop.